Hey guys and welcome back for another episode of my mystery series where today I want to share the story of Christina Kettlewell or you might know her as the eight day bride. My research tells me that this is one of the most well-known cases in Canada so I'm sure my Canadian viewers have probably heard of this before but it's not something I'd heard of and this story is tragic and fascinating. Over 70 years on, I we're no closer to an answer as to what actually happened to Christina. This web is so far from being untangled and there are a multitude of theories that could be possible. Christina was born as Christina Cecilia Mocon on the 7th of August 1925 in Toronto, Ontario, Canada to her parents Casimir and Mary Mocon. Her parents were Polish immigrants and devout Roman Catholics with very strict rules and opinions. At the age of 22, Christina had been dating 26-year-old John Ray Kettlewell, known as Jack, for about three years and her parents very much did not approve. He wasn't Roman Catholic. They also had weird feelings about Jack's friend and roommate, Ronald Barry, with whom it said that Jack had an abnormally close relationship. Jack and Ronald spent all of their time together and Ronald was said to be very overbearing. He was always a third wheel in their relationship. I think his birth name was Renardo Chufo, but he would have taken on a more anglicised name upon his immigration, as a lot of people did at the time. Christina's family eventually became so concerned about the relationship between Jack and Christina that one day her sister Helen showed up at Jack's apartment to try and convince her to come home, but instead, obviously, it turned into a blazing row, and it was so heated that the police ended up being called by very concerned neighbours. Helen ended up leaving and heading back home without Christina and just two days later on the 12th of May 1947 Christina and Jack ended up eloping. To get back at her family? Maybe. But as you'll see there was reason to think there was something a lot darker going on here. But there is no denying that Christina was besotted with Jack. Once married the couple spent a few days holed away at Jack's apartment in Toronto before heading off on their honeymoon on May 17th. And where did they choose to go on their honeymoon? To Ronnie's Cottage in Seven Falls, of course, which is about 171 kilometres north of Toronto. It wasn't too far from home, but it felt a lot more remote than it was, as it could only be accessed by boat. It probably felt quite romantic. Very cute. Ronnie lending his best friend his cottage for his honeymoon. That's very nice, right? Wrong, because of course, Ronnie joined the couple on their honeymoon. And then three days later, everything seemed to go wrong. For the past couple of days, it was said that Christina had been acting very strange. She was randomly bursting into tears and at other points seemed out of it and very dazed. And this kind of matches with the story Christina's sister Helen told about when she went to visit Christina a few days before the elopement. She said Christina seemed like she'd been drugged. Reports also say that Helen said Christina was drugged during the wedding ceremony itself, but it was an elopement and Helen wasn't there, so I'm not sure how she knows this. To be completely transparent with you, this case happened 75 years ago and original sources about this are scarce. Bar a few random newspaper articles I've been able to find that mostly deal with the aftermath of this, not the actual events, most sources are just rehashing the same information over and over again. But I don't actually know where a lot of it comes from, if that makes sense. So do take the finer details of this one with a pinch of salt, because there's a lot of the information that I can't confirm. Anyway, so the couple are off on their honeymoon with their permanent third wheel, Ronald Barry. On the 20th of May, so three days in, Ronnie leaves the cottage to go and do some sunbathing. But when he returned about 6.30pm, he noticed that the cottage was smoking. He runs inside to try and find Jack and Christina and finds Jack on the living room floor, barely conscious and bleeding from his forehead. He got Jack outside, but Christina was nowhere to be seen. And within an hour, the cottage had burned to the ground. Hoping Christina hadn't been inside, Ronnie bundled disorientated Jack onto a boat back to the mainland and took him to the hospital, where he was said to have been treated for burns and a head injury. It was also found that Jack had drugs, specifically codeine, in his system, and the police were contacted to let them know what happened. But it didn't take long for Christina to be found by a local, just 150 feet away from the cottage on a riverbank. Sadly, it was not good news. Christina was found face down, drowned in about nine inches of water. She was barefoot and stood in her pyjamas, but her body showed no outward signs of foul play. 
She hadn't been physically assaulted at any point, there were no cuts or scrapes or bruises, and nor did it seem she'd been in the fire at any point. Her body was free from burns, and there was no smoke in her lungs. The autopsy did show trace amounts of codeine in her blood though, the same as what had been found in Jack's. Ultimately, it was concluded that her cause of death had been drowning. Now, there were some interesting tidbits of information that came out in the aftermath of all this. Jack was interviewed by police for three hours, but he said that he had basically no memories of the afternoon all this happened, which could well be true because he did experience a head injury. Or he could have been lying, we don't know. Ronald was interrogated for 13 hours, but nothing came of his story either. 20 other people were also questioned, including a man called Major Lawrence Scarderfield, who was one of the people who first responded to the report of the fire. He went to the riverbank to get water to put out the fire, and interestingly, he said that he didn't recall seeing Christina there at any point, and he probably would notice a body in the water. Or maybe he was just distracted because there was a fire after all, when he just wasn't paying attention. One month later, an inquest into Christina's death began in Bracebridge, Ontario. Importantly, this was not a trial. No one was accused of her murder. This inquest was simply to determine whether or not foul play was involved in her death. And if it was, then arrests could be made from there and they could go to trial if they needed. They needed to find out was it a murder, a suicide, an accident? And this inquest was very dramatic. The courtrooms were packed out every day. This was a mystery that had immediately caught the interest of the public. It was splashed across the front page of the Toronto Daily Star every single day. The focus of this inquest was, of course, the only two other people who were there with Christina that day, Jack Kettlewell and Ronald Barry. And these two men became somewhat celebrities. The woman fascinated with this case would literally wait outside the courtroom just for a glimpse of them, and if they were lucky, they'd get an autograph. Eventually, the conclusion of the inquest came around and it was found that there just simply wasn't enough evidence to decide if foul play was involved or not. And from there, the investigation kind of just came to an end. So often, even still today, we'll see inquests kill a case. Once an inquest has been held and nothing interesting comes out of it, investigators will just stop investigating and that's that. And that is exactly what happened in this case. Which I suppose brings us on to a few theories to discuss. And I do tend to avoid speculation in the more modern cases I cover on my channel, as I think just sharing the facts is generally a lot more useful than wild speculation. But in more historic cases such as this one, theories are often all we have. The first theory I'm gonna mention here was something that was explored in depth at the inquest, and that was rumors of an unnatural relationship between Jack and Ronald, that they were gay lovers. You kind of have to admit, with the evidence I presented to you already in this video, the thought of Ronald and Jack being in love isn't all that crazy. They were clearly two men who had a very, very close relationship, they lived together, and Ronald was so obsessed with Christina and Jack that people theorised he must have been in love with Christina. But what if it was Jack that he was obsessed with? Being gay in the 1940s in the USA wouldn't have been very acceptable, but bearding would have been fairly common within the gay community. Bearding is the act of having an opposite sex partner, either knowingly or unknowingly, to conceal your sexuality. If this was the case here, Christina likely wouldn't have known it because she was undeniably obsessed with Jack, she was besotted. But this could explain away a lot of the weird behaviour, the strange third wheeling and obsession between the men. Some reports do say that Jack admitted that this was the case, but then at the inquest he claimed that he'd been coerced into saying this. A newspaper article from the Star on the 20th of June 1947 wrote, When Kettlewell, after vigorous questioning, agreed with Mr Hopes, the Crown's lawyer, repeated suggestion that he and Barry were male lovers, the fantastic triangle of twisted and thwarted emotions took shape. It was also said that the men's close relationship was often gossiped about between the locals of Seven Falls, where the cottage was, as they took frequent trips up to the cabin, just the two of them. It was fairly common knowledge, apparently, that there was something gay going on. Most people nowadays do accept that probably was the relationship between the two men, but that kind of just provides more questions than answers in this case. How and why did that lead to Christina's death? As is often the case, the most popular theory here has to do with money, a very common motive in crimes like this one. The inquest revealed a number of very strange monetary transactions relating to Ronald in the weeks and months before everything happened. 
It turns out that he'd been named as a beneficiary on two separate $5,000 life insurance policies for both Jack and Christina, policies that had been taken out shortly before the couple eloped. The policies also had double indemnity provisions, meaning that if they happened to die in the case of accidental death, the payout would be doubled. All in all, that would be the equivalent of about $260,000 today if you adjust the numbers for inflation. Ronald had also fairly recently purchased $5,000 worth of insurance on the Seven Falls Cottage, which again is worth about $65,000 today. Just a tad suspicious. What reasons would Jack have had to name Ronald as his beneficiary? Well, love could have been one of the reasons, of course, but it also could be explained as part of a very well-thought-out money-making scheme. No doubt it would look very suspicious if only Christina named Ronald as a beneficiary and cut out her family, but if Jack did it as well? Well, maybe then Ronald would just look like a really good friend. But Jack had also turned over his gratuities from the war to Ronald as well, which usually men do for their wives, so the love thing is looking quite likely here. There was also a question over Christina's missing engagement ring, a ring that Jack had borrowed from a married friend who popped the question. This ring would be worth about $13,000 today, but has never been seen since Christina's death. It wasn't on her body. And the cherry on top of the cake here is that Ronald did have a history of working within the insurance industry. He would have had a pretty clear idea as to how all of this would have worked. Did Jack, blinded by love, agree to go along with Ronald's plan to get some money, take insurances out on both of them, kill Christina, get that money, and run away into the sunset? Or did he potentially just not know of any plans at all and just wanted his love to get money in the small chance that him or Christina died? I'd place my bets on the former personally, it just all seemed way too planned. Or perhaps the money situation was just a coincidence here and something else happened entirely. The other big theory in this case is that Christina died by suicide, that she's the one who set the fire at the cottage that day. At the inquest, Ronald said that not long after they arrived at the cottage, Christina became moody and withdrawn and incredibly emotional. She'd rapidly switched between crying uncontrollably and just ignoring the men entirely. I mean, I must say, if I was on my honeymoon and my partner's suspected gay lover turned up, I'd probably be the same. I mean, I wouldn't be so shocked about the gay thing because I'm in a gay relationship, but I would be shocked if somebody else came on our honeymoon. Apparently, Christina was having doubts, according to Ronald. She had asked him if he thought that Jack really loved her. She didn't know where she stood with him, and it was clearly having an effect on her mental health. Jack didn't report any of this at the inquest though, and this all came from Ronald. Apparently he hid Christina's very strange behaviour from Jack, as he didn't want to ruin their honeymoon. But alongside Ronald's word, there were also three letters presented as evidence at the inquest, all written by Christina and all alluding to suicide. The first of which was written about three weeks before the elopement, or on April 6th, before they were even engaged. She was clearly absolutely besotted with Jack, she was overwhelmed with love even three years into their relationship, and she wrote that she couldn't bear to see Jack ever end up with another woman, and that dying would be better. She wrote that she was going to poison herself. Could she potentially sense trouble on the horizon of their relationship? Was Jack expressing interest elsewhere? Jack did confirm at the inquest that he remembered Christina being ill that day. It was Easter Sunday, so quite a notable occasion to remember. So maybe she did see it through, and maybe she did poison herself. In a second letter, she wrote, When you love someone, you really love him. And I know there is no one for me but Jack. And if I cannot have him, I don't intend anyone else to. As you might say, I waited in the hope that Jack would ask me to marry him. But I now realise that it might just be a passing fancy. Was Christina threatening to kill Jack as well as herself if things didn't work out? Very interestingly, Jack did recall feeling unwell himself around this time the second letter was written. Now both of these letters were addressed to Ronald, showing that he was very much aware of her mental state at the time of her death. That's if we believe the letters were indeed written by her. At the inquest, one handwriting expert confirmed they were undoubtedly written by her, but handwriting analysis is a very tricky thing, and some people think that it actually has no place in courts. Particularly back in the 1940s, when they wouldn't have had technology to assist them, they just relied on experts and their own eyes. As far as the inquest was concerned, though, this was definitely Christina's handwriting, and the letters were written by her. 
Instead of a love affair or even an insurance plot, could it be that Ronald hung around the couple so much because he was very aware of Christina's poor mental health? Perhaps that's the reason he went on the honeymoon to keep a close eye on her and to make sure she didn't do anything stupid. If that was the case, it is odd that he would decide to leave the couple alone to go sunbathing for a day, but maybe he assessed the situation and thought that Christina was well enough to leave alone that day. At this point in the 1940s, medical understanding around mental health would have been incredibly poor, and there's likely not much more Ronald could have done to help, bar getting Christina admitted to a mental health institution, which wouldn't have been any good, it would have been basically an asylum. Perhaps he'd been trying to treat her himself, drugging her into a state of stupor, and therefore explaining her drug state when her sister came to visit. The final letter was written on the 19th of May, the day before the fire and the day before her death and this time it was addressed to a Mrs Thomas, who was the landlady of the apartment she'd been staying in with Jack. Christina gave the letter to Ronald to post for her, and she wrote, Ronnie is in the boat outside somewhere. By the time he gets back, everything will all be over with. He must be afraid something would happen because he is staying an extra day to make sure we go back to Toronto with him. If these letters are real, then that says a lot about Christina's mental health at the time of her death, and could explain everything. Did Christina wait for an opportunity when Ronald was out, hit Jack around the head to force him unconscious, and then set the cottage on fire before drowning herself? Maybe, only we all know how difficult it is to end your own life by drowning. I would assume that Christina took herself to the middle of the river and got in the water, simply washing up on the part of the bank where she was later found. That could potentially explain why the local who was fighting the fire didn't see her on the riverbank at first. But the inquest says specifically that she drowned in nine inches of water, exactly where she was found. And according to the autopsy, she definitely did die by a drowning. Is it even possible for a grown adult to drown themselves in such shallow water? I mean, yes, it is possible to drown in such shallow water, but to do it to yourself? That's really difficult. Unless she was drugged up and fell face down, leading to her death, but that doesn't really point towards suicide unless she purposefully got herself the exact level of drugged up to be able to do this to herself. It's undeniably a very strange situation and definitely could have done with a bit more investigating. It does seem awfully convenient that the last letter was addressed to a landlady that she barely knew, but she just so happened to ask Ronald to post it. If Christina was in a poor mental state, then maybe it made sense to her to send this letter to this woman, maybe it was the only other address that she knew off the top of her head, but also it's a very strange choice to make. And why would she not post it herself? Why was she making Ronald post it? It seems weird that he would come to have all three of these letters in his possession. And there's also something else important to consider in this case. The fact that at the inquest, Ronald's account of the day in question seemed to change quite dramatically. At first, he told police a story that I've already shared with you guys, that he arrived back to the smoking cottage and went inside to look for Jack and Christina. He found Jack very dazed, dragged him out, Christina was nowhere to be found. But then in a newer statement, he claimed that when he entered the cottage, he found Christina straight away, that she was next to Jack, she was crying. He tried to convince Christina to exit alongside him and Jack, but she refused and he was forced to save Jack without her. About 15 minutes later, he re-entered the cottage to find Christina, but then she was nowhere to be seen. Conveniently, this new story makes Christina look very guilty, as if she'd been the one to start the fire. Ronald also said that he'd managed to save the three letters from the fire as well, which I don't think would be my priority if my cottage, my cabin was on fire, but apparently it was his. The special crown counsel at the inquest didn't believe a word that came out of Ronald's mouth, and he made his opinions known, calling Ronald a liar of the most blatant kind. It was very clear the crown thought Ronald had killed Christina, and then he'd tried very, very hard to cover his own back. However, ultimately the inquest found no evidence of foul play and both Ronald and Jack were allowed to walk away as free men. After the trial, Jack would go on to start a new life and he would never mention his history or Christina ever again. He remarried three years later and it wasn't until the 1990s when his daughter-in-law Sharon was researching some family history and then she came across Christina's story. Her and her husband, Jack's son Richard, were stunned but never mentioned it to Jack and he died in 1998. No further answers to be given. 
Sharon and Richard said to the star that Jack was a very easygoing person and just not confrontational at all. He avoided any situation where he had to be assertive. He was quiet and reserved and just the last person you would expect to have a history like this. Their theory is that Jack was very much dominated by Ronald, very much under his thumb. And the last time Ronald was seen by Jack's family was in 1956 when Ronald just disappeared off to New York, leaving his Pekingese dog behind for then two year old Richard. After that point, there doesn't seem to be any record of him whatsoever. So what do you think happened here? Was this a love affair between two men who wanted Christina out of the picture and a bit of money to start a new life together? Was it all Ronald Barry dominating the picture from every angle? Or did Christina really suffer so much with her mental health issues that this was an attempted murder-suicide? Or perhaps it was just a very strange accident, but that provides no answers whatsoever. What happened to make a marriage turn sour so quickly? Realistically, there are going to be few, if any, people alive now to provide any answers in this case. So bar maybe a deathbed confession or a letter being found and pulled out of nowhere, we're not really going to know anything. But as I always like to say, there is always hope, even if it's a tiny slim chance, cases have been solved on much, much less. Thank you so much for tuning in today and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.